So uh, I'm going to try and angle my notes towards me, but I'm going to have to walk back and forth so I can see what the, uh, what the forthcoming slides are. Anyway, thank you again to Google and to uh, Digital Rights Ireland. I'm here to give some context and perspective to what we're talking about today and to put, in a sense, the bigger picture on what has happened. And the reason that I might be in a position to put a bigger picture on it is that I've had a very unusual, and probably in our line of work, a very rare opportunity to take about a year and a half to stand back and reflect on the trend of the last 60 years and see where that might be bringing us. And what I've found is that we, all the people in the room here, are children of the Industrial Revolution, which we all know. But that means we share certain assumptions about where we are and where things are going. And actually, the assumptions of the emerging digital era are entirely different. So that's why I phrase this as saying, we're at a hinge in history. And in part one, what I want to do is, I want to give a sense of the context of where we are, and then I want to dig a little bit deeper and see what the benefits uh, that that can bring us are. So let's start with this individual, Dale Duggerty. Dale Duggerty was speaking in 2004 at the Web 2.0 conference, uh, that's now the O'Reilly Tech Conference. And he coined the phrase, Web 2.0. And what he was trying to get across was that by that point it was clear that internet users were more of an activist population than they had previously been assumed to be, partly as a result of Ajax, partly as a result of new generation websites. For whatever reason, that was the case. And what his colleague Tim O'Reilly suggested was that that could be leveraged in the software development cycle. So instead of this normal sequence where you go from pre-alpha to alpha to beta to release standard, and eventually you have a version that you release to market. What Tim O'Reilly was suggesting is, actually, we have to change what we're going to do. What we have to do is take this activist population of internet users and leverage their participation. So instead of having a very small, limited population of beta testers, which was the, the standard form for any of you who are engineers and developers, instead of that, you would leverage your entire population. And you would release your product to everybody and you would remain always open to their inputs and always open to uh, their requirements. So the software cycle would no longer be just a linear series. It would be an ongoing relationship. It sounds corny, but the idea is actually very powerful. What the idea meant to is a perpetual data. That information, in this case software, would always be malleable, would always be open to responses from its users that things would not be rigid and fixed, and that being dynamic in that way would give you opportunities. Now, to get across how big an idea I think this perpetual data is, there's really only one man that I can pull the screen right now, and that would be St. Jerome. So in 382 AD, St. Jerome was commissioned by Pope Damascus. He was commissioned to put together a Bible from all the various strands of bits and pieces that were sort of Bibles. So St. Jerome was the man who came up with the Latin Vulgate. And Pope Damascus had asked him this so that the church would have some cohesive documents around which it could build its, its doctrine and uh, faith system. And a thousand years later, that was recognized at the Council of Trent. And for anyone who uh, was Irish here and was raised a Catholic, you'll recognize that these words actually mean something pretty great. What the church was saying is that this is our official document. And if anyone has any ideas about deviating from it, will be tightened. So uh, Jerome's document, the Latin Vulgate, has now been existing for well over a millennium. And the church, with all of its centralized power and hierarchies, is saying, we want you to adhere to this document and do not deviate from it. The problem was that around about the same time, roughly, Erasmus, who was a biblical scholar, said, that's great, guys, but there's just one issue. The issue is that there are as many different editions of the Vulgate as there are copies. And the reasons for that should be obvious. The medium that they were using was incapable of retaining and conveying fixed messages. It was impossible to keep information from being changed as it passed from scribe to scribe over a thousand years. And you take a look at this 13th century phrasing Bible, you, you can see what we have in front of us. This is the work of the human hand. This is animal hide, berry juice, candlelight, and scribes working probably in not very good conditions. As you zoom in, you see clearly this is a, a, it's a beautiful, it's a rough human work, but clearly there are things that are imperfect about this information. I don't want to labor the point too much. But let's take a look at what we are used to in, in our age as children of the industrial era. This is a Gutenberg Bible. It's the one kept in the New York Library. 
this is perfect information. It's fixed. There isn't any room for interpretation about what this document is. Clearly, uh, every copy is going to be the same. And if there is an error in the first copy, that error is going to be perpetuated. So things are not going to change. So this, this is the age of ordered, inflexible information. And it begins with this device, Gutenberg's printing press. Now you might be wondering why I'm talking about Gutenberg's printing press, but I'm trying to suggest we should promote innovation. The reason is that I want to impress on you the scale of the change that we are, we are living through and, and how, big, how big the potential benefits are. Let's take a look at what that change looks like. From 2004 onwards, as I said, with the perpetual beta, information now looks like this. Not particularly tidy. When you really think about it, this seems to have more in common with that 13th century Bible than it did with the Gutenberg Bible. Now you can see that there's a padlock that's got a nice, uh, a nice little pink arrow facing that padlock up in the top left corner. And that padlock is to signify that some of you were editing this document so quickly that the Wikipedia authorities decided they had to control the speed of that editor and slow it down. Even so, when you zoom in, you see there's a warning saying, listen guys, we do hope you use our encyclopedia, but we just want to give you a caveat that people have been fighting over this piece of information. And the reason for that is that users are demanding the right to, to edit, to criticize, and to adapt. And let's see what those edits look like. We're about to scroll through, I just took a section of, of two years of data so this is two years. I've stripped out all of the changes all of these editors have made. So what you're getting is name, date, and time. So one line means one change, and that change could change the entire document, or it could change just one word. So we're going to scroll through all the changes for two years of the word jihad. And we're scrolling through 36 pages of A4 print, one line per edit. Now, that's how flexible information now is. So what I'm suggesting is that we're reverting back to a time when information was in a very flexible, changeable, and adaptable form. What I'm suggesting is that information is now plastic, again. And this should be something that is both scary and exciting, because as children of the Industrial Revolution, we haven't seen this before 2004. In this environment, where things are in perpetual beta, so to speak, there is no last word. Everything remains open to challenge and adaptation. And that being the case, there's a broad set of historical questions to ask. I'm not sure if you can see it on these slides here. Um, in the antediluvian oral tradition here, you see essentially uh, two uh, members of a primitive culture trying to draw the sticks on a wall. And then in 1450, we come up to Gutenberg's press. And this red zone, which is where we live, at least where we used to live, but certainly where we were born. It continues from the Gutenberg Press all the way up through the invention of radio, through the invention of TV, and even past uh, uh, everything that we've experienced as kids. And so, what's changing? Well, just to make that point absolutely crystal clear, with the beginnings of the early days in the ARPANET and network discussion, and culminating or starting to culminate with Web 2.0 beginning in 2004, my contention is that we have lived and we are used to the norms of the anomaly in history. That a, a moment when information was inflexible is not the norm. And as we adjust to the old order, the level, the nature of the adjustment we have to make cannot be underestimated, because essentially we're now sort of reverting to a completely different historical trend. So moving on to, um, to part two. In this section, having given you some context, and it's a very, very broad overview, what I'd like to do is, is show what the benefits of this move could be, what, what this reversion to plastic information means. If you take plastic information, which is new, and if you take global distribution, which is new, what are the benefits of those two things tied together? So, to save your reading, one of the best books you could buy for your family at Christmas. This is very much one of those stuff. I don't know the word. Uh, to save your reading that, I, I cut out a section. But I was trying to understand what people like Lance Lessig call remix culture. And I'm trying to understand what that meant. 
I thought, hang on, didn't this all happen in the 70s? Aren't we listening to the product every day? This is hip hop, people. This is people remixing music in their garages or on their basketball courts or whatever. So the character I found is Clive Campbell, who was a Jamaican, uh, a Jamaican immigrant to the US. Um, he, uh, he went under the name DJ Cool Herc, Cool with a K. And he started to play at parties in his apartment block, a very rundown block in New York. And so on the basketball courts, he would be playing remixes of punk, blues, soul, and jazz. And he would be using the disco turntable system to, to break the beats and live. And essentially what he was doing is, although he was at a remove from the initial artistic creation, Although he wasn't the originator, he was reinventing what he was working on. He was an artist. And in fact, he invented an entirely new force in the music industry, which right now is one of its most potent. So DJ Cool Herc, to me, is the exemplar of the Web 2.0 generation of adapters and reinventors. And where was he doing it? He was doing it in the least auspicious place for musical in innovation, at least from uh, very uh, standard perspective that you could find. Basketball and tennis courts in London are the block. So the lesson from DJ Coherc is if you have the tools and if you have the culture to remix and if you have that initiative, which our new generation has, participation can be anywhere. And the other lesson, of course, is that anybody can be Andy Warhol. And the internet can be your factory. If you take this idea that you can be in an apartment block or anywhere else, You've got the tools to modify cultural products at your disposal. There's no reason why you necessarily need to be surrounded by artsy types in a, in a loft in New York. You could be doing it through your laptop, as we well know. I don't think any of this is necessarily telling you anything you don't know. But if you consider the impact that DJ Cooler and Andy Warhol had together, and if you think the next time you look at a remix video by a 10 year old on the internet, of what these guys would be doing if they could have started at the age of 10 or 7 or 6, it starts to get kind of exciting. And why is it exciting? It's exciting, of course, because of tomorrow's soup. So this is Campbell's original American version of the tomorrow's soup can. And when Warhol reinvented that, it ended up looking like this. So suddenly a product and a packaging become a product. None of this is all that surprising. Now, Warhol's uh, item itself was then reinvented by Banksy in a spectacularly British way. Banksy didn't even choose uh, Tesco as good as it gets, or whatever they call it. He took, finest, yes. <laughs> he took Tesco value. So you've got Banksy on the left, Warhol on the right. So now we have soup container becomes art, becomes ripoff of very common art, new art. Now, Banksy himself then inspires an LA graffiti artist called Mr. Brainwash. Mr. Brainwash takes that commodity thing further, it becomes a spray. It's an area from other spray. And because he's called Mr. Brainwash, he's a little bit political. So now we have soup can becomes art, becomes art again, becomes art that's political statement if Warhol had already done it on the street. Now, for your average can of soup, that's quite a long journey. And that's the journey that every product and every item in our culture may find itself making pretty darn soon. But the question is, OK, we, we've had the arts, we've had the politics, we've even had a container that can you know, hold soup. But do we have business? Well, actually, yes. Yes, we do. This dress was created by Campbell Soup. Campbell Soup saw what Warhol had done, that they had taken their commercial item and made it into a cultural entity. And they leveraged what he had done, and they made this. This is a, it's actually made out of paper. It's a dress that housewives or house husbands in 1968 could send coupons for and then send to the company and people wear the dress and remind their friends that they were part of the RC suit using set. So this is a question really, not only of culture, there's more going on here, it's a question of business. And uh, we hear Jamie Boyle, Arts Classic, you know, we hear a lot of people talking about read-only culture versus read by culture. The idea for the engineers, or for the non-engineer in the audience is, you know, for example, CD bombs when they were first invented were read-only. You could not copy onto them. And then suddenly they became read by and people still didn't use them very much, but that made them a little bit better. So the question is, we've got read by versus read-only culture. 
And what do we need to do to make this read like this is read only business? That's the question. Can that Campbell soup thing happen for everybody? So, <coughs> excuse me. So this is a question that I had a colleague, uh, a lady who I write with at the Judge Business School of Cambridge, who wrote an article recently in Business Week. And our objective was to try and come up with an entirely new business model that leveraged all those things we knew were great and good and applied them to all those things we knew were in free fall, i.e. the music industry. And what we were proposing was, if you take the community building aspect of World of Warcraft, that interpersonal loyalty, all those things, and the, the development of growth of prestige from your character. And then if you take this remix culture which is developing, and if you add that to a subscription model, which is a new piracy, can you find a situation where the music industry can fold itself, in a sense, into the games industry, beyond you know, guitar hero and rock band, beyond those things, so that you have a, a very, very rich network where people in a, in a way where the media is presented them in an organized fashion where they can get everything that they need to remix, can you then have a situation where people who have actually created that content get some cash for it? We're pretty sure we're right, and we're pretty sure it's possible. And we're pretty sure it's possible because of a hint in history. But I'm going to get back to this idea in a sec. More recently, actually, in this one's business and finance, I have a piece talking about the the death of the mainstream and how the media industry are going to have to adapt to the rise of the activist audience. And not just to find out what people want, but to know people are in a position to give it to themselves. And the reason that any of these ideas are possible is that because we are at that age in history. So in setting things up for today, because the other speakers are going to go into their own experiences of their own media, and then we're going to talk about what law is required. Let's just reflect on the assumptions that we are used to. This is to give you an idea of just how fundamental the change is. If you take a look at the things and the technologies that shaped our world, the industrial era, you start off at rail, you get telegraph, and you get steam. You have standardization, things like the flight from the land, imperial conquest, the world going this way, and poles of power. This is London in 1897. And this is London Bridge in 1997. All of the areas where those strands hit in this hub and spoke diagram are bright red on the color map. So this is what Empire looked like, but this is also what all of our communication and our participation networks used to look like as well. And this is the pattern that we know and are familiar with. Now clearly, it took something major to break that pattern. I have to be more of a pattern, excuse me, people. As I said, it took something major. major. So in 1961, the start of our largest ever explosion was led off by the Soviets. And in the following year, Paul Moran, an engineer at the Rand Corporation, was trying to figure out how do we create a communications network that is vulnerable to a nuclear explosion. Although it was getting increasingly easy to loosen missiles onto one another, the belligerents in the Cold War found, well, the problem is we have no command control over those weapons. And so what he found is, if you take our standard communications networks, and if you rip out the center, well, then you have something quite exciting. So the reason I'm reverting to this is to say that the fundamental patterns of the internet rely on the death of the center, right from the early days in the 60s, because of the nuclear context. It's all about pulling that central pole, think back to London, uh, in the late uh, 1800s. It's all about taking that central pole away and putting responsibility at the nodal level. Um, this is interesting for us because although this started in the 60s, we are at the moment when this is starting to have an impact in media and culture. So what does that really mean? In Brown's document, he says, okay, this is where we are. The middle one looks sort of interesting, but the end one is obviously where we should be. So. We're at the moment, and I'm, I'm very, very nearly finished my presentation. We're at the moment where we're moving, or have moved, from poles to nodes. And the idea of a node is that the pattern of life in the digital era should be such that every node can potentially be empowered to be as important as any pole used to be, that every node is important and every node is a pole. And essentially what this means, from our perspective, 
is if you take a look at Andy Warhol and DJ Cooler, you can have the entire population, everybody, creating, remixing, re-editing. In the old sense of total war, you know, you know those ads where go buy war bonds, fund the Irish economy, buy tanks, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And the old idea of the war bond, this is a situation where instead of total war, we can fight total culture and total business. <coughs> Because the smallest item of effective participation in the emerging digital and cultural arena is the individual. To anyone who really, you know, has been born as a digital native, it is not shocking. It probably maybe hasn't been said so bluntly, but it's absolutely crystal clear and obvious. Instead of all these individuals and those individuals can be potent. Now, the other question is, what's out there for those individuals? You know, who are they going to sell to? What's going on? Well, there's an easy answer, and the answer comes in the form of this. Unfortunately, this should be a broken laser pointer. Um, the idea is that you know the internet doesn't just empower the individual, or as Jebediah Springfield said, in big and the smallest man. Uh, the idea is that the internet enables individual sellers and cultural creators to reach out to global niche audiences. <laughs> Firstly, previously did not exist because their needs could not be met. But secondly, could not be breached. So the reason I give you this, this Lego pointer, which should be broken, is that there's a great story about the founder of eBay. In 1995, Pierre Audemars, who established eBay, what he was doing at that point, he was a software guy, and uh, he was running his wife's website. His wife had an enormous pair of dispenser collection, so she was inordinately proud. And uh, she liked that her husband maintained the website that showed the world her pair dispenser collection. But in a corner of this pen dispenser collection website, he established something called auction web. And on auction web, he decided to run an experiment. The experiment was this. If I gave everyone perfect information about the items in my garage sale, will they make sensible purchasing choices? The answer he got may or may not have been right, but it led to the establishment of eBay. So what happened was, the first item that was bid for on auction web, which became eBay, was a broken laser point. And Pierre Audemars is an honest guy. He contacted the prospective uh, buyer, bidder. He said, excuse me, sir, uh, by email. Uh, I hope you recognize that this is actually a broken laser pointer. Are you sure you want to bid for it? And the guy said, well, of course I do. I'm a collector of broken laser pointers. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the message is that we are dealing with a marketplace of ideas, of culture, and of products so huge that nothing is beyond commodification. That as we have these empowered nodes, as every node becomes a creator and a participator, it's not that they just end up you know, twiddling their thumbs. People will find things to do if we can liberate the items for them to do it with. So that's, that, 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 that's really part one of the message. Part two of the message is, do we have the legal situation for us to be allowed, uh, allowed to do that? It's pretty clear from what we now know that we don't. We're waiting on a framework directive on collective rights in early 2011, and that may change some things. Um, there's obviously talk about uh, the fair use exception in the copyright directive, and there's a number of other things coming down the pipe. What Allegra and myself found in our article Business Week was that although we were pretty sure that what we were proposing was sensible and was right, it's also totally impractical under the current legal situations. For, for our idea to work, you would need to end the, the amazing fragmentation of rights within the music business. And you would need to have a situation, and it would bring up something like Google Books, you need to have a situation where all of the participants in creating every single track in your catalog have had some sort of sign-off, which is just absolutely impossible. So what we found is that we thought we had an idea that could, in a sense, bring back from the dead an entire industry, and yet the one fallible point of that was that we were completely, completely unaware of what the, the legal conditions were. And the legal conditions rendered that completely impossible. So let me just give you a few uh, parting words. Okay, so again, it's Christmas time, there's the book. <laughs> um, the point I'm trying to impress is that the scale of the change is huge that information is now plastic, that individuals are now potential nodes in a mesh economy of creative and business participation. 
and that we have in front of us a broad list and a list of arcane of potential the total comics. And the problem is um, that this really is a call for the government to act quickly, to leverage our population and to make this total comics happen. And the only sticking point, because somehow the technologies have appeared in front of us, the only sticking point at this at this moment is the law. If you want to know more, there's a great book. And uh, please feel free to get in touch with me. Thank you.